morning, everybody. Uh, let's sing Jesus is in this room. Jesus is in this room here right now, here right now, making this place a stand on the ground, on the ground. Your spirit moves. Your spirit moves and breathes all around, all around. All good and perfect things flowing down, flowing down. If all of the heavens are singing along with the saints and the elders, the glorious song. Holy, holy, holy. 
Father, we come to you this morning just grateful for another day that we have to worship your great name. We thank you for this congregation. We thank you for these brothers and sisters in Christ that we get to worship uh, next to, that we get to focus on your word with. And Lord, we just ask that your will be done, and we thank you for your great love for us and the sacrifice of your son on the cross. It is in your great name we pray. Amen. Before you grab a seat, I'll invite you to say hello to your neighbor as we begin our, our service. I'd like to just uh, have another prayer. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Lord God, um, it is amazing how throughout history, when people least expect it, you just, you ambush them with your grace, with your presence, with your love. 
Lord God, we pray that you would move in a mighty way in this place. Lord, that you would give us ears to hear, uh, that you would do a work in our, in our heart, that your word would be planted deep in your heart and produce, produce faith, produce righteousness, uh, produce courage in our lives. Lord God, uh, we thank you for your presence here. And we thank you that you promise that your word will go forth and it will not return to you empty or void, but it will produce. So Lord, we avail ourselves to you and speak to us for your servants listen. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd encourage you to open up uh, your Bibles to our devices to Daniel chapter 3. We're continuing the series on the book of Daniel, uh, how to stand firm, how to love well in a culture of compromise. And today we're actually going to be looking at Daniel's friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or if you're VeggieTale fans, Rack, Shack, and Benny. And uh, we're going to be looking at these guys who they started in a culture that was very supportive of their monotheistic beliefs, their belief in one God, and their belief in absolute morality. But when they were teenagers, they were dragged into captivity into Babylon, modern-day Iraq, uh, where they were in a culture where morality was relative. There were numerous gods, and all of the public institutions were antagonistic to these guys' beliefs. And these guys had to learn how to live stand-up lives in a bow-down world. And we are going to hear how this book that was written 2,600 years ago is incredibly relevant for us today. So Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. 60 cubits, that's 90 feet high, 9 feet wide. Now a lot of people think that Nebuchadnezzar built this statue to represent him, and he wanted people to, to worship him. But it doesn't say that anywhere in the text. More likely what's going on is he built this statue to represent all the gods of Babylon, as like the spirit of Babylon, the power of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had a vast kingdom. He was the superpower of the day. And it says in verse 4, there's lots of nations and languages. And Nebuchadnezzar knew that all of these nations that he conquered, they had their own gods. And what Nebuchadnezzar was saying with this statue is like, look, you're free to worship your own gods as long as you don't worship your God exclusively, as long as you don't claim that yours is the only one, as long as you don't think that yours is the right one and the only one, as long as you admit everyone else's gods are real and valid, you must be tolerant of all the gods and all other worldviews. And as long as you are... Um, the way we know that you are is you will bow down to this statue and you will agree. And Nebuchadnezzar wants everybody to bow down, not so much because he's arrogant, although he is certainly that, and we'll see that next week with uh, chapter 4. But he's really doing this so that there will be peace in his empire because he thinks the only way there is going to be peace is if you all agree that all religions and all gods are equally valid and nobody says one is better than the other. Nobody says one is exclusive. Today in our culture, the way we hear it, especially if you go to college campuses, it's religious pluralism. It's religious tolerance. And that is that all religions are equally valid and all roads lead to God. And as long as you agree with that, everything is fine. But as soon as you say, my God is the true God, um, I have the truth, I have the way, the faith. Then the daggers will come out. And in our Babylon, where you live and work and move, personal faith in Jesus is not so much the problem. It's our insistence that Jesus is the only way of salvation, and he is the one who has all authority. You're not going to get into a whole lot of trouble for saying Jesus is your personal Savior. But you will if you say Jesus is the only way and there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved and that he has the authority to set the rules for morality. If you do that, there probably will be some consequences, as was the case with these three friends. 
verse 2. He then, Nebuchadnezzar, summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Now, the commentators that I was reading about all of these names of these uh, kind of government officials, they, it was hard to make sense really what their role was and, and what they do. And I just thought to myself, wow, government bureaucracy already 2,600 years ago, right? Everybody has a title, really don't know what it means. But Nebuchadnezzar is assembling a massive crowd, we're told, on the plain of Dura. Most commentators estimate that it was at least a few hundred thousand people to dedicate this statue. It says in verse 4, Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. That phrase, nations and people of every language, it's actually really important. We haven't seen that phrase for quite a while in the scriptures. You have to go all the way back to Genesis 11. Actually, before that, Genesis 10. There is a guy named Nimrod. Okay? By the way, parents, if you have a kid and you want to name your kid after a Bible name, just keep reading, okay? <laughs> Don't name your child Nimrod. It will not go well for him. Nimrod actually goes and settles and makes a nation state in Babylon. And from that, eventually Genesis 11, you see that uh, the people want to build this Tower of Babel, and it's to show their independence from God. And in Genesis 11, God scatters them into different people groups and languages and nations. Interestingly, after Genesis chapter 11, immediately in Genesis 12, God comes to Abraham and he makes a promise to Abraham that through Abraham's descendants, a Messiah will come. And that Messiah, Jesus, will bring back all peoples together in unity around the true God, Jesus Christ, the great I Am. But in Daniel 3, what we're seeing is Nebuchadnezzar is attempting to bring all these nations and peoples together to worship the false gods. And he did it in the very same place where they set up the Tower of Babel. And what God wants us to know is what really is going on here. This is really the primary battle of the human race. Either we will worship the true God or false gods. We'll either be independent from God or we will be dependent upon him. Verse 5, as soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Now today I'd like to give you some polemics, okay? Some defense for Christianity, and, and that's so that when you are speaking with your relatives, coworkers around the dinner table or outside, you know, at the beach or whatever, and these current events come up, you'll be, able to, you'll be able to have a conversation with them and be able to talk to them. So the, in, a, in a way that is actually going to point them to the beauty of Christ. Nebuchadnezzar says to all the people, basically, you need to do this or die, Okay. The spirit of Babylon will always say, you must conform to our worldview or there will be consequences. Now, the spirit of Babylon always claims that it's incredibly tolerant. But if you look closely at the spirit of Babylon, you will see that it actually becomes very intolerant. It will say, believe whatever you want. Just don't try and convert. Don't say that you are right and that you're the only way. And I just want to say this as gently as I can to those of you who are skeptics, maybe online or here even in person, and you've kind of bought into this, this view. When you say to a Christian, uh, you can't say that you're right and that you're the only way and you can't convert, when you actually are saying that, are you really being tolerant? I mean, think about that. When you say that to a Christian, you're actually telling them not to do the very thing to tell, telling them to do the very thing you don't want them to do. Let me explain. If you say to a Christian, um, 
Don't claim that you're right. Don't try to convert or persuade other people. What are you doing in that moment? You're actually telling them that they are wrong, and you're actually trying to convert them to your view and to your understanding. And when people think that they're very, very tolerant of having many gods and many different roads to God, what happens is they become very intolerant when somebody says, no, there is only one true God, and his name is Jesus Christ. And then here's what skeptics will say. They'll say, well, if you claim that Jesus is absolute, you're going to end up, especially if you get power, Christian, you're going to end up oppressing people with your views. And then they, you know, talk about, you see religions around the world, some religions do oppress their people, absolutely. But that's they don't understand Christianity, and you've got to tell them what's at the core of Christianity is what? It's a cross. And look at the cross, and there you see Jesus suffering, bleeding, dying, loving, forgiving his oppressors, right? He's, he's acting that way. A true Christian who really understands the gospel would never oppress another person, okay? So back to our story, hundreds of thousands of people are standing there, and then all of a sudden they bow down before this statue. And there is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing up, standing up in a bow-down world. And then somebody whistles them into Nebuchadnezzar, and I'm going to jump to verse 12. They say to him, But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Now, Nebuchadnezzar knows how valuable they are to his kingdom. So they're like, listen, I'm giving you an, another chance. Please just bow down and everything will be fine. And what Nebuchadnezzar doesn't realize, he's picking a fight with God. Okay? And that never goes well. He says, what God will deliver you out of my hand? So what Nebuchadnezzar is doing is this is not just about a, a, a failure on their part to, to listen to his leadership. He's now moving it into the theological realm. And he's basically making, a, are you going to worship your God? Or are you going to worship uh, my God? Are you going to, are you going to um, bow down or not? And then these greatest words of the whole story, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. And again, just love how they show just respect to this guy who could kill them. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Now, I cannot verify the heat of this furnace, okay? But, you know, a typical campfire that you have in your backyard, a few hundred degrees, maybe 400 degrees, we know from history that Babylon had a number of these furnaces because they would melt down precious metals like the gold to make this statue. I looked up. It takes almost 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit to melt gold, okay? So this furnace is really, really hard, hot. The spirit of Babylon will just keep turning up the heat on you until you conform, until you bow down. And if you don't bow down, the spirit of Babylon, the culture, will say there's going to be consequences. And it will do everything from excluding you, to calling you names, to canceling you, to boycotting your business, maybe even firebombing your medical clinic. It's the spirit of Babylon today. It's no different than 2,600 years ago. 
And then I asked myself, what would I do in that situation if I was those three guys? It would be so easy for me to come up with all kinds of rationalizations to justify why I should bow down. I'm bowing down on the outside, but on the inside, I'm not. I could make the rationalization, okay, I'm going to go ahead and do this, but God will forgive me afterwards. Or how about this? What good am I to God if I'm dead, right? All kinds of ways that we can rationalize our compromises with sin. We do it all the time. But you need to understand this. Our rationalizations often annul God's revelations. Here's what I mean by that. When we compromise our Christian convictions, we don't leave room for God to work. As Mark Batterson writes in his book, All In, when we take matters into our own hands, we take God out of the equation. When we try to manipulate the situation, we'll miss out on the miracle. If Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have compromised their integrity and they would have decided to bow down to this statue, they would have been delivered from Nebuchadnezzar's hand. They would have saved their lives, but they would have sacrificed their integrity. To bow or not to bow? That is the question. What would you do in that situation? I mean, these guys' faith is so strong. They basically said this, I believe God can, I expect he will, but I trust if he doesn't. These three young men believe that God can. They can face their fear of the furnace because they have a fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And when I say fear of the Lord, that's not like shaking in fear that he's going to drop something on you. Fear of the Lord is he is so awesome and so majestic. He is all powerful. I would never want to be on his bad side. Christian courage starts out with God is awesome and he is all powerful. He's bigger and he's greater. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. And I just imagine this. Here's these hundreds of thousands of people looking at these three guys. And those people are probably thinking, look at how small they look compared to Nebuchadnezzar's power, compared to that big furnace. Look at how tiny they look compared to that huge statue. They are in trouble. And then I imagine the three guys thinking, Look at how small Nebuchadnezzar's power is and how tiny the furnace is and how puny that statue is compared to our great big God. They are in trouble. God is bigger and he is greater. There was a fun kid's song that we used to sing uh, years ago. Uh, Veggie Tales made it popular. God is bigger than the boogeyman. He is bigger than Godzilla or the monsters on TV. Oh, God is bigger than the boogeyman. He is watching out for you and me. Our God, whom we serve, is able. Paul in Ephesians 3 says, Our God is able to do immeasurably more than we can think or imagine. God is able because he's greater, stronger, bigger. He's stronger than your disease. He really is. He is bigger than your broken marriage. He is bigger than your loss of job. His grace is more powerful and it goes deeper than your sin. His power is bigger than your death and your grave. Faith says, I believe he can. And then faith says, not only I believe he can, I expect he will. The three guys say, and he will deliver us out of your hand. They believed God would deliver them. They expected he would. That's what faith says. And by the way, uh, they might not have been talking necessarily right about that furnace in front of them, although they knew he could do that. They knew what every person who walks by faith, every person who dies in the faith, that no matter what, guess what? God will deliver. And that God would save them from an end far worse than temporal death. Because they knew the true God they knew the king of kings, Jesus the king, is the only one who could save them from a much hotter fire. And Jesus, who is the most loving person 
Whoever walked this earth, even his detractors will tell you he was a loving person. This is what he said in Luke 12. He said, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Jesus came to save both body and soul. He has authority over both body and soul. The spirit of Babylon can only harm your body. It cannot harm your soul. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that the true God could save them. And he saved, and he did save them. He would deliver them, even if they die in the body. Because they know God would do what Daniel wrote later in chapter 12. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise and those who walk by faith will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. They knew Nebuchadnezzar gave them a very scary death sentence. I'm not trying to minimize that. They must have been terrified. A very real death sentence. But they also knew that that death sentence was part of a paragraph which was part of a chapter, which was part of a glorious, never-ending story that God is writing. And an ending that will be more glorious and more joyous than you can possibly imagine. Faith doesn't just believe God can. Bold faith expects he will. Now, when it comes to this world, we have to remember, of course, God is not a vending machine that we just put a quarter in and we get whatever we want. But God wants us to continually walk by faith. And as we do, you just never know when he's going to not only show up, but show off his power. And that's what he did with these three guys. So let me just ask you, where do you need to press in on your faith and trust God and expect that he will? Maybe it's sharing your faith with a family member or a coworker or a neighbor. Maybe it's inviting them to be a part of your hope group or to kids camp. Maybe... Maybe it's confessing a sin you've been holding on to in secret way too long and confessing to a sin so that you can finally be healed and freed from it. Maybe it's persevering in prayer for someone's healing. Where can you press in and believe that God is going to move? But faith also does say this, but I trust him if he doesn't. This is trusting the sovereignty and the goodness of God even when you don't see him working. This is trusting him even when you get thrown into the furnace. These are great words of faith. Verse 18, but even if God does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. God can heal your disease, but if he doesn't, worship him. God can heal your broken marriage. But if he doesn't, worship him. God can change your financial situation. But if he doesn't, worship him. What these friends are saying is they believe God was not only big enough to protect them, they believe that knowing him was better than anything that they'd ever have to give up, including their lives. Because faith believes not only is God bigger than any adversary, but God is better than any alternative that the world can offer. Nebuchadnezzar throws him into the furnace. We worship God not so that we get our will done. We worship God so that we can better know his will for our lives. And these three guys found out that it was God's will that they be thrown into this furnace. We should never choose suffering, ever. But we choose to do God's will, and sometimes that means suffering. It might include it. Friends, if our ultimate goal is comfort and ease only in this life, most likely we will eventually deny God. And if you walk with the Lord long enough, you will know at some point you're going to have to choose between Christ and comfort. They're thrown into the furnace. Now, here is where... This passage is so helpful, especially as you're talking with your unbelieving friends and coworkers, because here's what most of them are saying. 
about God. How could a good God allow so much suffering in this world? I can't possibly believe in your God. There are just too many furnaces in this world, too much suffering. When you understand this passage, you're going to be able to actually help them and comfort them. So we jump to verse 24. It says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, Your Majesty. So he asked all the government advisors, like, weren't there three guys? Like, check the clipboard. Yeah, there were three guys. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. Nebuchadnezzar sees this fourth man. Now, he doesn't know the right theological term, so he says it looks like one of the son of the gods. He's close. It's the son of God. And I don't have time today to just prove to you from Scripture why this is really the second person, pre-incarnate Jesus, in the flames with these three men. And this will show us how you can give this great answer to people who are struggling with the problem of suffering. And how can God be good? You see, Nebuchadnezzar, he knew this was ultimately a showdown between his gods and the God of these three friends. And when he sees this supernatural work, I mean, these guys, their, their hair is not even singed. They don't even smell like smoke. I cooked breakfast for my family yesterday morning over an open fire. I stunk. I had to take a shower before coming to work. These guys don't even smell like smoke. This is how miraculous this is, okay? Therefore, Nebuchadnezzar says, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Now, Nebuchadnezzar has not learned to tame his rage, okay? But he does understand what God did. He says, did you get that? No other God can save in this way. I think he got it. Do you? And this is going to be so helpful for your skeptical friends. I can't believe in Christianity because of all of the furnaces and all of the suffering. Friends, do you realize that you are going to face furnaces of suffering, whether you believe in God or not? You might live the most privileged life and never suffer, but sooner or later, you're going to have to face the furnace of the suffering of death. And who will go with you when you have to go into that furnace of suffering? What can be better than this kind of God? Don't search for a faith that will keep you from the fire. It doesn't exist. Search for a God who will be with you in the fire. God will either deliver you from death or through death. But deliverance is guaranteed. God may get you around it, but usually in the Bible, he actually gets you through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't get to fly over it. I have to walk through it. God will deliver you either from the furnace or through it. And the Son of God is in the furnace. See, Nebuchadnezzar was right. No God saves in this way. Why didn't God just reach down and pluck these three guys out to safety? Why didn't he blind Nebuchadnezzar and all the government officials to save the three guys this way? Only the true God walks objectively in the furnace. Why walk around in the furnace with them? Why? Because ultimately, this is pointing to Jesus and his suffering on the cross. You know, Matthew 13, Jesus is speaking about God's holy judgment on mankind and man's inhumanity to man. God must judge that. And he talks about that judgment and he uses the phrase, it's like a fiery furnace. And people will ask, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying. Why? Why would he sweat drops of blood? Why was he so horrified, so terrified at that moment? Because at that moment, he was looking into the opening of the fiery furnace that he was going to have to go into. 
And he went to the cross, and there at the cross, he took all of the sins of the world, the selfishness and the rage and the hatred and the rebellion and the immorality. And he went willingly, and he experienced God's judgment for us. For us. He stood with the three friends in the furnace, but when he went to the cross, he stood alone in that furnace. And he died, and he was buried. And just like these three guys walked out of the furnace without even a trace, Jesus walked out of the tomb alive. Christ took the flames so we could emerge safely without a trace of judgment or sin upon us because we are in Christ. Jesus doesn't rescue by just reaching down. He goes in. No other God will do that. The true God of the Bible is the God who suffers with and for his people. For God so loved the world that he suffered. And because Jesus dealt with the worst fire, we could ever face. Now, every time that Satan turns up the heat, every time the spirit of Babylon puts you into a furnace of affliction or trial, if you let Jesus, he will actually use that furnace and that fire to refine and purify your faith, which is far more worth than gold itself. And he will always, always, always be with you in it and deliver you through it. Amen. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Oh, Lord God, we thank you for our Savior who entered in to this sinful, broken world, and he took it all upon himself. We thank you that he entered into the fires so that we would never have to. Lord God, I just thank you for this time And I just pray for each and every person in this room and those who are listening online. If they've never received Jesus Christ as their Savior, oh, I pray that they would, by faith right now, receive his work at the cross, that they would never have to fear or worry about your holy wrath, that their sins can be forgiven, that life would be given to them now and forever, and that Jesus would promise to walk with them each and every day. I pray that each and every person would just call out to you, O Jesus, and just ask you to be their Savior and their Lord. Lord God, we thank you um, for your presence here. And Lord, we need courage in these days. Uh, The spirit of Babylon continues, and maybe in some ways it's stronger than ever. Lord God, we know that your word clearly states that you are the Lord of life and you knit every person together in our mother's womb. Each person is made fearfully, wonderfully, and in your image. And we are so thankful, God, for the decision this past week from the Supreme Court that our nation has taken at least one step to align laws more to your righteousness And we ask that you would continue to change hearts and minds. Lord, we celebrate life. We promote it. We continue to pray for your protection on the unborn. And we also pray for protection upon um, life clinics all around this nation, that you would protect them. Lord, we know um, that your word says that Abortion is taken a life. It's murder. But we also should let the world know that we are here for every single woman and we want to serve and walk beside and assist them with our resources. Would you help us to show that we are for listening and loving? We are for fostering kids and adopting kids, that we are for serving more, donating supplies, mentoring young women, walking and holding their hand, whatever way you call us and equip us. Lord, as the culture rages, would you help us to love well? Most of all, Lord God, we ask that you would help us to hold up the glorious cross of Christ and his wonderful good news that each one of us is a sinner and our sin runs so deep 
But because of Jesus Christ, your grace runs deeper. And there is forgiveness and life in his name. May we as individuals and as a church be known most for the glorious gospel of Jesus that saves and makes all things new. Oh, Lord God, we pray for your blessing upon the ministries of hope, and we specifically lift up to you the next generation, and we pray for our kids' camp. Oh, Lord, you know how important it is to sow seeds of the gospel at an early age that it might take root. So would you bring to us many kids, especially those who come from an unchurched home, who don't know you, that we might share the good news with them and their parents. We pray for your Holy Spirit to anoint that week. We pray that you would raise up uh, the volunteers that are still needed, that we might serve everybody who comes. And Lord God, we pray too that as we leave this place, we would be salt and light, that we would stand firm, but we would love well, that you would remind us we follow a Savior of the cross. And Lord God, would you use us uh, to bring influence to those around us, Lord God, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you that we get to worship your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the earth. I need you now to do the same thing for me. He's enough for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh Stand and sing this next part with us, church. I'm calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David. It's your faithfulness I'm standing, never changing. 
you heard your children then you hear your children now you are the same god you are the same god you answered prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same god you are the same god you were perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you trust in the lord forever for the lord the lord eternal is the rock eternal
the great I am. The mountains shake before him, the demons run and flee. At the mention of the name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am, the great I am, the great I am. shake before him the demons run and flee at the mention of the name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great i am the great Enjoy the rest of your week. God bless, and we'll see you next Sunday.